Welcome back, everybody. This is our final day of inference class, um, but it's not the final day you'll be thinking about inference. Of course, we have final exams for that, qualifying exams, things like that. You're going to grapple with this stuff throughout the entirety of your career as to what to do and why to do it. And when somebody asks you why you're doing what you're doing, you're going to tell them a criteria. So you're going to tell them what your method does, there's some objective to it. And then either you don't argue for theory or simulation study or some practicalities, but you have to demonstrate that you're actually achieving your goal. So I think. Now I hear a lot of people, they say, well, the theory says this, but they don't demonstrate what they're doing with whatever their sample size or their particular model. And that can always change like the, the practicality. Maybe something happens as n goes to infinity, but if n were infinity, we would know all the answers. And so the limiting argument isn't good enough on its own. It's how does it work under your sample size in your situation? Um, we've been kind of saving the worst for last hypothesis testing. And it's a, it's a big controversy. Basically, we're testing if something is true or not true, and we'll never know the answer. All we have is proxies to that. And the criteria we're going to use for determining what is true, I, which decision we're, we're going to make, that's probably the most important thing. So what Naaman and Pearson are doing is they're calibrating air rates. They're not putting measures on the null hypothesis itself. And the Bayesian is doing that. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. But just kind of going back to this example that we're all pretty familiar with, I should probably write down what the example was. The XIs are coming from a normal model with mean theta variant sigma squared. You see NIID replicates out of this. And you want to know a few things. So what we derived last time, and this is in your book, is the Megan Pearson test corresponding to the one sided hypothesis. So you could write this maybe like this, but you write um, H1 is theta is less than or equal to theta. Null. And that would be the typical way of writing this now. So um, I usually will end up considering this to be the complement, but really this is going to be the point. Um, this I usually think would be the complement of that. This is the maximum of the type 1 air in that range. And that's why we plug in theta naught instead of the whole thing. I.e., when I look at the power curves for this, the power for all the other thetas on the other side, this is the null space and this is the alternative space, at least pertaining to test 1, that hypothesis. And so you're bounding the maximum um, type 1 error. And that happens at theta naught, so you plug that in. The power function that we got for this was just this thing where z is the random variable, x bar minus theta divided by a standard error. And so you can draw this whole power curve. So if you compute all these probabilities for varying theta, where this is theta over here, This is theta, this axis. And this right here, this axis is power. It's these functions. And power functions are probability, the boundary between zero and one. Um, there's nothing wrong with this power curve in my opinion. I think that's totally reasonable. If you're calibrating error rates, I have no problem with it. And in fact, if you ended up thinking of the, the p value that corresponds to this problem, so let me just tell you what the p value is. Instead of thresholding this thing right here, you can look at the probability of more extreme data. And so, in our case, that might be something like x bar. I can look at where x bar lives in this distribution, and then I can talk about more extremity. So, in the one-sided case, you might look over here at that tail probability. And that tail probability is going to be the p value. And if you've taken a stat on a one class, or done any statistics in your life, which you've had, you've computed this p value before. Um, if you're doing the other sided case, you'd be looking over here 
at minus x bar. We're looking at more extremity over on this side, right here. And the power function that you would get relating to that would be this blue curve. It's just the flip side of all of that. And so I wrote down what these thresholds were. Last time I made a mistake, and for this side of hypothesis, the critical threshold would have been minus 1.64, not plus 1.64. And if you just computed the error probabilities conforming to that, um, you would have figured out I could see so that this thing wasn't type 1 error rate of 0.05, it was type 1 error rate of 0.95. Um, the controversy comes in when you're testing this hypothesis right here. So what I, what I just said is that this power function right here, this probability you're computing, might have been some evidence against the null hypothesis, and maybe we can use that power function as a measuring stick. It's to relate how plausible we think the null hypothesis is. Unfortunately, in this case right here where you're testing the sharp hypothesis, the sharp test, um, there is no UMT test. So basically that monotonic function you get, you can either go in this direction or in this direction. And so you have these two different power curves. So you just calibrate C a little bit differently in this case because of symmetry, it's just going to be the plus or the minus. Um, in this case, the compromise is to consider um, unbiased tests. It turns out that these two tests right here, they're already unbiased. I.e. the power function in the alternative space is bigger than the power function in the null space. And you want that to be true. Um, has to do with the monotonicity of the likelihood ratio test statistic in the first place. Remember, we're bounding that thing with an inequality. We're saying that as that thing gets smaller or bigger, we're going to make a decision. Of course, if we're only using one side of an inequality, and it goes up and it goes down that function, you're going to have some problems understanding what it means. And the power function for this right here um, there is no uniformly most powerful test just because of the, the size of that inequality. So the compromise is to constrain the test to live in a class of unbiased tests and then consider the likelihood ratio of test statistic. Ultimately, that gets you this power function right here. This power function has the same shape as that. The only thing that's changing in this is we're just going to change what C is so that we're testing both of the tails. This is the two and a half percent tail thing. And so just for type 1 error rates of 0.05, that would conform in this thing to a critical threshold of minus 1.645, and the other test would be plus 1.645. And if you wanted to compute, um, if you wanted to calibrate the, the type 1 errors in the sharp test, that would be 1.96. Would be that number that you would plug in. So basically, there's still cumulative distributions of normals, and I'm just changing the threshold. So this conforms, conforms to the 5% tail right here, i.e., if C were, if it was this minus 1.645, this would be 5% over to the left hand side. If it were minus 1.96, it would be 2.5%. And, and so they split that on each side. Um, Saying all of that, that I, I don't really like this test all that much, Damon and Pearson are correct, that if you're interested in calibrating error rates, then this is the right thing to do. The problem is, is that the p-value corresponding to all of this, right here, um, they're not measures of your null hypothesis. They have nothing to do with it. In the one-sided case, they do, but in the two-sided case, they do not. Let me just tell you. So if I computed a p-value for test one, and let's say my p-value, so for test one, we compute a p-value of p star. So I just compute that tail probability. 
And somebody said, you know what, I don't want to test the one-sided thing. I want to do the shark test. So for test three, the corresponding key value can tell me what it is. So in test one, you computed P star. Say P star was like 0.03. What are you doing? 0.03 divided by 2? Times 2. Times 2? Yeah. So multiply by 2. 2 times 2p goes the other way. I'll let you think about it. That is 2 times p star. Donker's like, what? It should have gone down at least. It probably shouldn't have gone up. But it does go up. It's 2 times that. You can compute 2 times your final probability. So in the one-sided case, if your x bar was over here, you would have computed one of these tails. In the two-sided case, you add both of them. So two times. Let's just think about this. If this was a measure of the null hypothesis being true in the first place, we could take it as evidence of the null hypothesis being true, and that's what Fisher wanted to do, and that's what Heyman and Pearson said. Ah, it's not true. Think about the size of this alternative space. This one right here is all of my thetas less than theta naught. So theta naught, and the whole size of the space that I'm testing in the alternative is just that, right there. Or if I think about in the null space, how much mass am I considering? I'm considering all of this, this whole interval. Theta is greater than theta naught. But if I think about this, so this is going to be h naught is theta is greater than theta naught, right here. That's what I'm looking at. And in this case, right here, theta is equal to theta naught. How much bigger is this space than that space? Infinitely bigger. Much, much, much larger. So if the p value is a measure of the null hypothesis, as that space gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that value should go up, not down. Should be this one goes up, that one doesn't. For test one, shouldn't it be theta less than or equal to theta zero? This is... Shouldn't it be equal? The, this one has the equality here, this one doesn't have the equality here. So this is h1 is theta is less than theta naught. That's alternative. So the null is theta greater than theta naught. Oh, okay. So easy to get confused. We've got a bunch of tests up on the board. And it's in an inequality. This is the thing that takes some time to think about. Sometimes it's not okay. So the p-value is not a measure of the null hypothesis in general. In the one-sided case, you could take it to be that. But in the sharp case, you cannot. And that's where all the controversy arises. The question is, is, what are we really thinking about when we're testing this hypothesis? Do we really want to know, or I should say this hypothesis right here, versus this? Do we really want to know that theta is equal to theta naught? So think about any testing problem where theta lives in a continuum. So theta is a continuous value. What's the probability that you pick the right theta in the first place? Zero. There's no way you got it right. Unless you're incredibly lucky that I'm going to say you cheated. So there's no possibility. And so one repercussion to this in the sharp case, in the case where h naught is theta is equal to theta naught, and the alternative theta is not equal to theta naught, in any real problem, where theta is continuous, as n goes to infinity, your p-value, We'll go to something. What does that key value do? 
it'll go to zero. Why? Because you didn't take the right data. So even if you are epsilon away from the truth data, your p-value is going to cascade towards zero. So Fisher is really asking, is theta theta not? And I can tell him the answer. I wish I could tell him the answer. No, it's not. Um, of course, they didn't have lots of data back in the day. So what they would do is they would take this framework and do something different with it. Is they would calibrate what n was so that their power was a certain hot, certain size in the alternative space. They might calibrate some distance called the effect size that they're looking for, and they would compute what n was so the probability of making a type 2 error is bounded by some pressure. And then they would just go out and collect that many samples. I think that that's reasonable. Um, if you're interested in calibrating air rate, saying that, I already know that it's not, it's not true. You're probably always wrong if you're not rejecting it. That's probably not what we want to do. And this problem has crept in to, um, science and engineering through the last like 20 years. We can collect a lot of data. And so computing these p values is just not useful in the shark case. This is probably the most used test out there. Let me ask you another question. If H naught theta is equal to theta naught is true, but you misspecify the model, you make a mistake. So I have some nav model by x size and I condition on theta naught. But I have a misspecified f, i.e. it's not normally distributed at some other distribution. Keep in mind, data does not come hand in hand with the model. In my class, it does. In school, it does. When there's a whiteboard present, they might. But when you're actually out there in the field collecting data, your data doesn't come. You might impose some asymptotic model, you might approximate things, but my guess is you're always wrong, because you are. So what happens when f is misspecified, but you actually happen to pick the right null hypothesis? Let me give you the answer. Who knows? So you might reject because f was misspecified. So if you pick t, you know, 45, versus a normal, and the data was generated as normal, you're not necessarily just going to reject because of the symmetry properties of everything, but your type 1 error rates will be totally miscalibrated. It won't be right. So you won't be doing what Maven and Pearson said. So Maven and Pearson's framework works if you know true F. And so that's a problem. And this has created a lot of controversy over the years, and certainly you've heard about it. Um, I'll point out one of the controversies that spurred some debate. I can't read through my mask. But my screen is going to pull that off. I'm about 40 feet from everybody. So I just want to point out this thing. This is on my web page. You can read through it. Um, let's just look at the journal itself. I think the context is always important. Somebody said something. I want to know who somebody is, and I want to know what they do. So even when I read the news, it's like that. I want to know who they are who wrote the thing. And I want to know what they do, and I want to know what their conflicts of interest are so, so that I can frame their opinion. So this is the Basic and Applied Social Psychology um, Journal. And it's got a couple editors. And that's up here, Michael and David. So they, they threw a, a hand grenade into the field of statistics, things that statisticians already knew but they did something very extreme. Um, let's just flip to it. So I don't know if you can read this, but I'll, I'll read it to you a little bit. Just make that bigger. So the basic and applied social psychology BAS 2014 editorial emphasized that null hypothesis significance testing procedure, they mean named in Pearson. So that's, their language is a little bit off from our language, but they mean Neyman and Pearson, is invalid. It's valid. What they mean is that it's not useful, maybe. 
Uh, and thus, authors would not be required to perform it. So um, there's a site in here. Does anybody know who this person is? They cite themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so they're self cited um, However, to allow authors a grace period, the editorial stopped short of actually banning Naaman Pearson. The purpose of the present editorial is to announce that the grace period is over. From now on, Bass is banning Naaman Pearson. Um, there's a few questions in here. Well, manuscripts with p-values, keep in mind, Naaman Pearson is one-to-one -one with p-value calculations. So if your Naaman Pearsonian test statistic, the test statistic that you get out of the likelihood ratio test is um, bounded by something, and that something is calibrated to the type 1 error, that is equivalent to bounding p-values by the type 1 error and rejecting if they fall under it. The book has plenty of problems for you to work through so that you can see that. So I've assigned you, and on the, the final exam, I'll, work, I'll, I'll have you work through a few problems like that as well, just so that you can really drive home the point that there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. So will manuscripts with key values be desk rejected automatically? Answer, no. If manuscripts pass preliminary inspection, they will be sent out for review, but prior to publication, authors will have to remove all vestiges of Naaman Pearson. P values, T values, F values, statements about significant differences or lack thereof, and so on. So, pretty harsh maneuver. Um, regarding confidence intervals, they end up saying there's a one to one correspondence. So, most confidence intervals, a lot of them that we compute, we didn't cover this in this class, are one to one with everything. I either going to be some interval, if you use the pipping form of a confidence interval, uh, it's going to be regions of theta values that you would have rejected if the null hypothesis was true. So it's the ones that would have given p-values less than 0.05, for instance. And so they'll give you that region. So confidence interval, while it has that coverage interpretation, um, it also has that interpretation that it's one-to-one -one with p-value. And that's usually true. Um, regarding confidence intervals, the problem is that for example, a 95 confidence interval does not indicate that the parameter of interest has a 95% probability of being within the interval. Rather, it means merely that if an infinite number of samples were taken and confidence intervals were computed, 95% of the confidence intervals would capture the population parameter. And now it gets to how Naaman Pearson fails to provide the probability of the null hypothesis, which is needed for a strong case for rejecting it. Confidence intervals do not provide a strong case for concluding that the population parameter of interest is likely to be within the stated interval. What I pick up on in that sentence is they say the probability of the null hypothesis, which is needed to provide a strong case for rejecting it, what they're saying is that you need to be a Bayesian, because Bayesian is going to do that. And we'll look at that one more time. And they go on and they, they finally die well. Bayesian procedures are more interesting. So that, that's pretty subjective. <laughs> you're allowed to be interested in whatever you're interested in. So I'd say that's a pretty flimsy case for something. I think it's interesting, so we'll use that. Um, the usual problem with Bayesian procedures is that they depend on some sort of Laplacian assumption to generate numbers where none exist. The Laplacian assumption is that when a state of, in a state of ignorance, the, the researcher should assign an equal probability to each possibility. What they're saying is that you put a uniform prior on everything. And they say it in a really weird way. So I can sniff these guys out. They're no Bayesians. I mean, they are. But I, I have a problem with this statement because Laplace said to use all kinds of different priors, not just the uniform prior. So we need better properties for our priors than just we want uniformity. A uniform prior doesn't make sense in a lot of cases. In this case, where we're testing theta, is the mean and the normal model. That's the common prior that you use. If you want to know more about that, take a Bayesian class. It'll be one in the fall. And we'll cover more about this. Um, so they kind of shook the statistical world. The ASA responded. So the American statistician came in, and this is a preprint of everything. Um, and it's kind of just a summary of what a commission looked at. So the American Statistical Association said, well, we better say something about this if other fields are saying something. 
Let me just ask you before we look at what the ASA said. Um, what is it with psychology? Why did this pop up in psych versus other fields? Why were they the first one to run in? Because they used to be valued a ton. They used to be valued a ton. Yeah, that's true. A ton. Yeah, I would say so. Like two tons. <laughs> we got a lot of tons of p values. Yeah, they use a lot. Why else? It has something to do with this. And it's big. So, my experience in psychology these days, uh, instead of putting you on the couch and trying to figure out what you want and talking about, you know, your, your parents or something like that, what they do is they now send out surveys to everybody. So they send out a million surveys and they get a bunch of responses to everything. So N is huge. You know, N is like 10,000 for them. Their p-values are going to probably duck out all the time. So everybody's out there saying, this ridiculous theory that I came up with that isn't right in the first place, it might be close, but it's not right. I figured out I can reject it. Good job. So they've got continuous parameters out there. They might be in the ballpark, but they're rejecting everything because n is big. And so that's not great. I probably would have banned the um, shark test. It's probably the one that I would ban. So you're not allowed to do it unless you're like thoughtful about it. And I'll say a little bit about that, but it's hard to do. The ASA kind of came in and they had a, a pre-commission in this manuscript that's also on the web page, you can look at it. Um, kind of talked of, through the narration of what you know all of these different people in this commission talked about before they went off in their separate ways and tried to advocate what to do. Let me give you the punchline first. They didn't say anything new to us. It's all the same stuff. So no argument to solve. We've just rehashed it that we all disagree with each other. Okay, so why do so many colleges and grad schools teach P is equal to 0 0.05? So name and Pearson, if your P value ducks alpha at the 0 0.05 level. So I wouldn't say P is equal to 0 0.05, it's alpha is equal to 0 0.05 with P ducking alpha. Common misconception. But that's what they mean. And so the answer is because that's what the scientific community and journal editors use. I guess that's true. So why do so many people still use P is equal to 0 0.05? Because that's what they're taught in college or grad school. <laughs> so it's this circular sort of thing. It's because we've done it for so long. And it's kind of riddled our existence. Um, OK, so there's been a whole bunch of articles that have come out. One of these scientists wrote Gina Nucho, she teaches here at Virginia Tech. She's up in the Arlington Center these days doing some teaching. If you ever get a chance to meet her, she's a very interesting person. Um, super astute, understands this problem pretty well. Um, okay, a few other people came in. So Siegfried came in and said, it's science's dirty secret, the scientific method of testing hypotheses by statistical analyses that stands on flimsy ground. Okay, so that's provocative. Keep in mind, maybe the Pearson are right. If you know F, you're calibrating air rates. But the p value itself is not a measure of the null hypothesis. Um, another article that came out in Science News numerous deep flaws in null hypothesis significance testing. Um, statistical techniques for hypo testing hypotheses have more flaws than Facebook's privacy policies. So, <laughs> lots of cool articles out there. So I'm trying to provoke you. There are lots of questionable things going on in hypothesis testing. Again, I think the key is to understand what is our goal, what are the objectives, and is that objective reasonable in the context of your problem? Um, so somebody came in, Jeff Leake said in his Simply Statistics blog, it's a good blog, I read it periodically, the problem is not that people use p-value poorly, we wrote, is that the vast majority of data analysis is not performed by people properly trained to perform data analysis. So that means you don't dare analyze your own data. You have to come to somebody that knows how to use this and understands all the deficiencies. Nah, I, you know, people should be able to use this stuff. So I, I'm not sure that a, a trained statistician has to be the one to, to do stuff. Think about regression modeling. Everybody knows 
So you don't have to be a statistician to do it. We kind of understand how to do it, and it's a good idea. So if it's useful, it should be something useful for the vast majority of people, I would say. But it's super confused out there what people are actually doing. I've highlighted a few more things. Um, really, the issue is about reproducibility. So what are the actual air rates out there? So in most fields that they've gone and surveyed the literature and checked how many hypotheses that have been rejected out there, a lot of them have been rejected inappropriately. And so reproducibility rates are abysmal out there in science. You know, you're supposed to have like a 5% error rate across the board if everybody's using alpha is equal to 0.05. It's a lot bigger than that. So it's something like 80% what's going on there. So this was supposed to be a shield against errors, but people are abusing it. Um, so somebody says that p-values aren't the only problem out there, but it's a big one. And it is a big one. Um, just read a few more comments in here. P-value near 0.05 taken by itself offers only weak evidence against the null hypothesis. Val Johnson, 2013, wrote about this. In order to keep the statement reasonably simple, we did not address alternative hypotheses, air rates, power, among, every, among other things, and not everyone agreed with that approach. I bet no one agreed with that approach. So because that is what we're talking about. So um, I'll let you read through this a little bit more, but there's a, a few comments in here that they went through, and if you want to survey the literature and try to see what they came up with with everything, what the Bayesian group ended up suggesting eventually, and what the frequentists, the naming Pearsonians, said eventually is they said nothing new. Basically, they disagree on the criteria. I think we have to talk about alternative hypotheses. We have to talk about air rates if we understand what these two camps are doing. Um, so the native Pearsonian, Fisher, for instance, it's really asking this question, is theta theta dot? So is n gets big, and they come to the right conclusion. No, it's not. So let me give you a strategy if you want low p-values. So if you compute a p-value and it's 0.08 under this test, and you don't like that because you can't get it past your editorial board, what, do, what should you do? Sample, go get more data. What would happen if the null hypothesis was in fact true? Can you keep sampling? You'd make a wrong decision. What's that? Wouldn't you make a wrong decision? Yeah, eventually you would. So what would happen? So p values under the null hypothesis, and you can um, check this. I'll probably ask you on your final just to have you compute it. The probability of more extreme data given the null hypothesis is true if the null is actually true, that's a uniform random number. So the p-value is uniformly distributed if the null is true. So let me just write that down. If h naught is true, i.e. theta is equal to theta naught, your p-value that you compute will be uniformly distributed between zero and one. So that means that if I drew from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, and I considered some threshold to be 0.05, what's the probability that a uniform random draw dots 0.05? 0.05. 0.05. Does that have to do with like order stats and the distribution of that? It does. It's just a transformation problem. So it really is just a transformation. That's outlined in your book, and they give you a proof of that. It's sitting in your book, you can find it on Wikipedia. Um, but you can prove that for yourself. But a p-value is a transformation of the data. So you can prove that that transformation, what distribution it follows. So I'll give that to you in a final problem so you can work through know where that comes from. I don't think it has anything to do with your order stats. Um, so what that means is if I just keep sampling from these uniform distributions, eventually I'm going to find something that dots alpha. 
just keep drawing from a uniform distribution where you eventually get something that ducks 0.05? Yeah, one out of every 20 times. Um, it's a little bit different than if somebody just walked into your office and said, I have data and I want you to um, compute a p-value for me or something like that. I might use a very uninteresting technique. I could have used this and say, well, let me just draw a uniform random number real quick. So you have your data, you have your hypothesis, don't show me either one of them, and I'm going to draw from a uniform distribution. And I come up with a p-value, a uniform draw that's less than 0.05. Let's say I compute some number 0.04, and I say, yeah, you can reject that call hypothesis. They say, well, don't you want to hear what my hypothesis was and what my data is? And I say, no. I'm just giving you something that has type 1 error rate 0.05. It's not a very good idea. It turns out the power in that case, or the type 2 error rate, the power is also 0.05. Type 2 error rate is 95 in that case. So if you don't use your data or the actual hypothesis, your type 2 error rate is through the roof. So Naaman and Pearson tell you how to lower that using the likelihood ratio test stat. Stephen? Does that mean that if, if a p-value is not really uniform, does that mean like size of the p-value, if it's like 0.9 or 0.3, does it really mean anything? I think the p-value size doesn't mean anything. Okay. So in the one-sided case, I will walk that back. But in the sharp case, I don't think the size of the p-value means anything at all. I think it's the alpha level is the thing that means something. So the error rate is the only thing you can look at. So if you have a p-value of 0.03 and you're doing a sharp case, I don't think it's relevant. So it doesn't mean anything. It's not a proxy for the size of the hypothesis itself, the probability. And if you want to have a, another discussion, I've got another paper for you. So that'll walk you through all of this. But I don't think it means anything. So keep in mind what Naaman and Pearson were trying to do is trying to help out Fisher for making this claim that the p-value of size meant something. And Fisher didn't like it. You know why Fisher didn't like it? It's not just because he, was, he didn't want a threshold. And I, I kind of sympathize. I don't want a threshold. At the end of the day, when we make decisions, we do have to like, draw lines. So, but in a lot of cases, I, I still like to say, but I kind of think this. And I like to quantify what that means. Turns out, um, Pearson, that's Egon Pearson. And it's Carl Pearson's son. Carl Pearson had a fierce debate with Fisher. And Fisher held a grudge and just didn't like anything with the name Pearson. There really is a lot of that bad blood that's going on in science. And some of you that got to join us for the historical lessons last semester can see that that's true. So, um, Naaman and Pearson were doing something that was mathematically correct. Fisher was mathematically flawed. And eventually, Fisher came around and he advocated something else later on. Let me tell you what Bayesians do, just real quickly, to remind you. And they have a different problem. So again, in all of this, if you are an Aiden Pearsonian, that's cool, um, you're calibrating the rates. And so your alpha level is the most important thing. And you have to decide whether or not that's appropriate. If you're a Bayesian, you're going to do something different. So the Bayesian, Compute the base factor, usually. So base factors and there's a lot under the hood with these things. So they look like the kind of like the max likelihood ratio, the max the, mo the maximum likelihood ratio test stack. Looks kind of like that, but instead of maximizing, we're averaging. So I'm going to take my likelihood function, and then I'm going to consider some prior on the null space, and this is always true. This is true regardless of the hypothesis type that I use. So I'm going to put some prior on thetas under the null hypothesis, and then I'm going to integrate. And I'm going to integrate only in the null range. And then I'm going to divide by 
what happens in the alternative space. Take the likelihood of function. And that looks appealing, but of course somebody's going to ask, how did you do the averaging? And it makes a difference. Of course it makes a difference. So, how do you place weight in the two different spaces? And that's where all the controversy lives. So, so these, this right here, is your weights. on theta and h naught. This is something similar where this is going to be the weights on theta and h1. And the question is, is how do you do this in the sharp case? You might be able to think about how to do it in the one-sided case, but in the sharp case, it's a lot harder to think about this. So, if you use a continuous prior on theta, the probability of H naught being true given your data will be equal to zero. And the reason why is because if I ended up integrating over theta, d theta, theta is an element of h naught, i.e., this goes from theta zero to theta zero in the sharp case, to pi theta, d theta, that's going to be zero right here because I'm integrating over a point. So if you walk into the analysis and you say a priori, the probability of my null is zero, your likelihood function will overcome. So what you have to do is something different. And this is what Bayesians do. And I talk about this in some length in my Bayes class, and I think I'm going to make this a, a lot bigger of a deal. There are practical applications to this. So if h naught theta is equal to theta naught, h1 theta is not equal to theta naught, the typical prior people would use is a mixture prior. So a point mass mixture prior. And what they'll do is they'll, I'll just draw you a picture of this first. And so I'll put some point mass on the null hypothesis. How much mass are they going to put on it? I'm going to call it pi naught. So this is going to be your probability that H naught is true in the first place. And then they're going to consider some continuous prior over the alternative space. And so this right here is going to be pi H1 on theta. It's how you smear mass on the alternative space. So maybe you want to symmetrically build mass around the null. In the alternative, symmetrically build mass around the null. So the point mass mixture prior looks like this. Pi to theta. This is going to be my probability of my null being true. Times how I put mass on the null space. And how you put mass in the null space is just an indicator function. So I'm going to indicate that theta is equal to theta naught and multiply by pi naught. And then in the alternative space, I'm going to place some weight. This is going to be my probability of H1 being true. It's just a complement. Bayesians are always working with probabilities on whatever it is that they want to learn about. quite a bit different than what the p-value is doing. They're putting probabilities on more extreme data rather than the hypothesis itself. And so this is the, the alternative has the weight you're going to place on the alternative, 
and then also how you smear mass over the alternative. And how you smear mass over the alternative space makes a big difference. And so, and that's all I'm going to really say about that. But you really need to experience this for yourself to compare these two different methodologies. They're very different. So what the Bayesian is going to do when they start thinking about this is they're going to think about how you actually smear mass. So maybe this is a normal distribution. So EG might be normal. It might be centered theta naught. And then it might have some alternative variance. This isn't the only thing going. There's a lot of different ways you can smear mass and they give you different properties. But this is my alternative variance. That's psi right there. And ultimately, what this is going to do, what psi is going to do, is tell us how far away from the null hypothesis we need to be before we're willing to reject it. So we can calibrate break that probabilistically. And so Bayesian is not calibrating air rates, but rather they're making a comparison between the null space to the alternative space. And so they can take this base factor that they compute from all of this. In the point null case, this thing right here is just our delta function. Theta is equal to theta naught. This part right here. So this would be the prior on the null space. It just places mass at one point. So it's really easy to characterize. But you can compute from your Bayes factor the probability of the null itself. I'll conclude with this. So the probability of H naught, given my data, is going to be equal to 1 plus Bayes factor inverse, 1 minus pi naught over pi naught. And I'll make you verify this on the final exam. That this is equal to the probability, it's just algebra that you have to work through, of x given h naught times pi naught. This is the probability of h naught divided by, I should not write down probability of x because x might be continuous. So this is just your marginal model. I'll write down what that is in a second. h naught pi naught plus 1 minus pi naught px given h1. And I should tell you what these things are right here. This is just going to be the integral of whatever your model was. I'll write it down as fx given theta. And then I'm going to end up writing down my prior hi, where i can be 0 or 1, over theta, d theta. Theta element of hi, where hi is going to be either h0 or h1. We're going to do the same thing. So this is just the margin of everything. And it turns out you can either write this down, which looks very intuitive. This is basis. This is just your probability of H not being true. So by following Bayes' theorem, it takes this thing and flips this around. That's Bayes' <laughs> um, Bayes has a couple things going for him when you do this. Is that really I'm comparing the null to the alternative. So the Bayesian's going to answer the question, given the data, which model do I like better, the null or the alternative? It's basically placing a measuring stick on each one. My data is closer to uh, the null. My data is closer to the alternative. Of course, I'm speaking pretty weakly there. What do I mean by that? I mean this, right here. And so the nice thing is, is that 1 minus the probability of H naught, given x, when you do this, this is equal to the probability of the alternative. So the Bayesian is really calibrating things to the alternative. Bayesian's going to ask which one is closer, the null or the alternative. And the name of Pearsonian is asking a different question. How well does the data support the null? 
Remember, the alternative is only going to point the tail direction in a different direction. You don't actually make a firm comparison to it. So Bayesians are comparing on average, and name and Pearsonians are calibrating air rates. Totally different thing. So you put them in the room and you say, argue this out, and they have totally different objectives. So they don't get very far with that. Um, for me, personally, I like making comparisons but I don't always know how to smear mass in the alternative space, so I try to avoid doing it if I can. In one-sided cases, I will say this, just to give a little bit of um, relief to some of you, sometimes people agree. So if we're dealing with the one-sided case, and I might ask this on your final exam as well, so if, um, X eyes are coming from a normal model. Sigma squared, everything's IIB, IC, and data points. And we take the prior, pi theta, or I'll say, yeah, pi theta H1, right here. So I'll do this. H1. If I let this be proportional to 1, and I do the same thing on the null space, it's going to be proportional to 1. And I'm testing this hypothesis, h naught, theta is greater or equal to theta naught versus theta less than theta naught. So the Bayesian is thinking about the prior being like this. So in the normal space, theta is greater than theta naught, their prior looks flat. In the alternative space, their prior looks flat. You cannot do this in the sharp case. You cannot use flat priors in those cases. You will not get a meaningful answer. But if you do this, it's a Bayesian right here. And you pick that prior and you say, well, I'm going to put uniform prior on both sides in this normal model, then the posterior probability of H naught given your data, and if you want it to work with either your whole data set or you work with X bar, you'll get the same thing because X bar is sufficient for theta in our case. But your posterior probability is going to be equal to the P value. So in the one-sided case under this flat prior, in this particular setup, the posterior, the Bayesian will compute, is the P value. So we get green in that case, which is kind of reasonable. But in the sharp case, there's no chance of an agreement. The Bayesian and the non-Bayesian will never agree with each other. So I'm going to leave it off right there and try to fill in some of these gaps through our take home final. I'll be issuing that to you on Tuesday. You'll have two days to do it. Um, I'll try to get it out to you bright and early on Tuesday. Um, don't be surprised if it shows up Monday night. Just to give you a head start. So you can read through and start thinking about it. You'll be sending me the solutions over email. Um, and I think I said by 3 o'clock on Thursday, I need those. So that I can grade up and get them in by 5 o'clock on Friday. Um, if you've done any of the extra credit assignments, send those over as well. If you feel that you need some points or whatnot. And if you want to discuss any of this, midterm two, some of the homework, I'll be on 5.30 on Thursday. So I'm willing to stay as late as possible. Um, if you guys need anything else, just shoot me an email. And I can meet you. That's it for now, you guys. So, Keep thinking about this stuff again, it's going to come up throughout your entire career. If this is daunting to you, it's daunting to me as well. So what do I do? I like to estimate. And when I estimate, I like to think about decision theory. What are my losses? And so that's something we can all agree on. That's where we use it, is an estimation. So probably the next 30 real answers for real problems. OK, that's it, you guys. Thanks so much. It's been a wonderful class. I hope you all have a great time.